Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were men that were dancing, creeping, and crooked, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? What's a tantalus? Or a gasogene? And what's the difference between a hansom cab and a four-wheeler? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 281, The Hoof Marks in the Priory School. Well, hi there, and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast, where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, it would behoove you to have prepared for today's show. Have you prepared? Well, I've been saddled with so many responsibilities. <laughs> That I have, uh, uh, and I didn't tell you this, Uh but, you know, with all of the difficulties that we've had as a nation medically, Mm -hmm. um, there does appear to be an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease here in New Jersey. Oh, uh, boy. Well, that is a horse of a different color. What? What? And I just got a call from my canter, so I don't know what to... (laughs) <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I'll hand over the reins to you, and you can lead the rest of this. Uh, I say nay, nay. Nay, uh, nay, nay. See what well, you start. See what you get started there. I know, I know. Well, it, this kind of reminds me of uh, when someone asked Dorothy Parker to use horticulture in a sentence. <laughs> she said, "You can, you can lead a horticulture, but you can't make her think." <laughs> Dorothy Parker. Uh, all right. I like, I like to have a martini, too, yes. at the absolute most, and I won't finish the rest of that. If people can look that up. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Well, a uh, little housekeeping here. If you uh, would like to get the show notes to this episode, including a link to a book where you can get this a wonderful essay we're going to discuss today. You can find it at ihose.co slash trifles281, all lowercase in that URL, and that'll take you to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com site. And there you can find all kinds of things, including the ways to get in touch with us if you'd like to email us. That's a, an, a unique option. We are trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com. And if you would like to see us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, that kind of thing, we are at I Hear of Sherlock. And of course, you can find our Patreon support button right there on the site or simply go to patreon.com slash trifles to support the show. Uh, For as little as a dollar a month, your contributions help us not only with the well, the operations of IHOS Central here in terms of email and uh, the web and uh, hosting and you know the squirrels that are running the internet on their little wheels, but you also give us a chance to do the research that we need to do in order to produce these quality shows. So, and as you know, we here at Trifles put the K in quality. Well, this is one of those episodes we call a Master's Class, where we look at a piece of significant Sherlockian scholarship of yore, and we bring it up to the microphone of the present. And in this case, we are selecting an entry from the book A Remarkable Mixture 
Award-winning articles from the Baker Street Journal. This is from 2007, and it is edited by Stephen Rothman, the editor of the Baker Street Journal. And these are all Morley Montgomery Award winners from uh, the very beginning of the award. If you're not aware, the Baker Street Irregulars Award, uh, uh, the best article of the year, uh, the Morley Montgomery Award, which comes with a cash prize. So what an incentive to get out your pencils and start writing something for the Baker Street Journal. The Morley Montgomery Award began in 1958, and it was uh, dormant for a while from uh, 1980 through 1994. It was resurrected again in 1995. And in this article, uh, this is by S. Tupper Bigelow, who is a significant Sherlockian from Canada. He was the first Canadian to win the Morley Montgomery Award. Uh, this is the hoof marks in the Priory School from Volume 12, Number 3 of the Baker Street Journal, September 1962. So, Bert, would you care to set up the premise for uh, Bigelow's article, and then we can saunter through it? Yes, but before we do that, you know, as I typically do, but I'll do this very quickly, hopefully, I just have to say the source of this article is so wonderful. You mentioned the book, of course, but its original appearance was in the Baker Street Journal, volume 12, number three, September 1962. And so you mentioned earlier our research well, I checked out the EBSJ. I decided to go back to the source and look at the issue. And, you know, it was the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle issue of the Baker Street Journal. It said so on the cover. And the representation of Holmes that normally features on the cover of every Baker Street Journal in those days, drawn by Freddie Steele, had been replaced by a drawing of Conan Doyle. Which is now, I must say, the world's best drawing of Conan Doyle. It, uh, his mustache uh, looked like two ice cream spoons that he'd been inhaling. <laughs> um, but the wonderful contents of the of the issue, it had four articles, including one by Adrian, one by his son Adrian. So you could tell that Julian must have had in his mind the idea of perhaps repairing relationships with Conan Doyle's son. It had an article by Edgar, who'd passed away two years previously, about the Baker Street Irregulars, um, a memorial tribute to Edgar Smith, who was the head of the organization, by Joe Hall. And it had an essay by Sir Poor, Paul Gore Booth, who was the head of the Sherlock Holmes Society in London at that time, on Holmes and the hoof marks and other things and the hoof marks in the Priory School by S. Tupper Bigelow, whom we've mentioned in the past, who was a prominent, prominent um, Canadian um, jurist and also expert in um, all things to do with the turf. And in fact, he'd been uh, greatly responsible for regulation of fairness and accuracy and driving crime out of pursuits on the turf in Canada for many years. So um, that's just by way of saying that they're just wonderful things to discover if you want, if you if you have this sort of cast of mind and you're interested in in what was going on in Sherlockian things in the 1960s when you go back to these sources. But to your point, the hoof marks in the Priory School begins immediately. Here's the here's the deal. Tupper Bigelow pulls up this wonderful scene. <laughs> Really a wonderful scene from the, the Priory School where Holmes and Watson have been into the case and they've seen some evidence. And um, Holmes is talking to Watson and says, now, Watson, make an effort. <laughs> he says, now, of course, perhaps I read too much into his tone, but he says, now, <laughs> don't, Watson. Don't, don't strain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Watson, now, Watson, make an effort. Throw your mind back. Can you see those tracks upon the path? And Watson says, yes, I can. And then Holmes says, can you recall that the tracks were sometimes like that, Watson? And he arranges a number of breadcrumbs on the table. And sometimes, uh, and, and of course, it's a pattern, you know, and, and it's reprinted in print as a series of dots. So 
the tracks were sometimes like this, and then the dots change. He says, occasionally like that. He says, can you remember that? And Watson says, no, I cannot. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> but Holmes says... But I can. He says, I could swear to it. However, we will go back at our leisure and verify it. What a blind beetle I have been. You know, and we've referred to that in the past. Not to draw my own conclusion. And, and Watson says, okay, what's, so what do you conclude from this? And Holmes says, only that it is a remarkable cow which walks, canters, and gallops. <laughs> and Tupper Bigelow, now that he has your attention, Tupper Bigelow says, for, what, for it was, of course, a horse. And it is very interesting to observe, in, the, in passing, by the way, that when the Priory School was published in the Strand in 1904, um, a very interesting article on the use of imitation cow's feet placed on the hooves of horses to deceive followers had been published in May 1903. And then Tupper Bigelow says, well, you know, let's not make any accusations here. But by the way, he says, we've seen this before with the plot of the Golden Pince-Nez, which came from a mag publication called The Apocrypha, which had already been pointed out by another author in the Baker Street Journal uh, 10 years previously. However, says Bigelow, these are mere vagrant thoughts compared to the matters to be discussed here. And off he goes into the analysis. Yeah, and you know, this is, this is going to be an interesting exercise because we need to describe the visuals that uh, accompany the, uh, the, the the canter, the walk, and the gallop, uh, which essentially were colons and uh, periods in the in the publication. So um, you're going to have to shut your eyes and imagine us uh, talking about these. Um, looking at looking at Bigelow's text here, um, he says. In any event, while the canter and the gallop are certainly two different gates of a horse, although superficially familiar, even to most riders, a canter would appear to be simply a slow gallop, the reproductions of the two gates in the Doubleday 1953 edition are the same. <laughs> Putting a colon in front of a period to represent a canter and a period in front of a colon to represent a gallop does not make them different. Apparently then Watson, in a careless effort to make the gates appear different, it would appear that he knew they were, uh, they were different. And lazily attempted to deceive his readers by a very superficial effort. Readily seen through, one would think. Although, to the best of my knowledge, Bigelow writes, this matter has not been discussed before in the writings upon the writings. And, you know, this is interesting, Bert. I don't know if this should fall into uh, the, the realm of animals, of sport, or of punctuation. <laughs> yes, or publishing. <laughs> yeah, well, right. Well, right. well, and that gets us to Piccolo's conclusion, which he says, well, you know, the, this laziness might be very well attributed to the publishers. Uh, the thing that, that bothered me most, says, says Bigelow, Bigelow, is where did the fourth hoof come down? Because if you look at these markings, they look to me. <laughs> and again, I pointed out that he had he, this guy. The, Tupper Bigelow was a jurist who was very intimately involved in the regulation of racing in Canada, including uh, assigning groups of photographers to capture film and photographs of races. So he's speaking with some considerable authority, more, in fact, as you will find out when you get to the end of, of this particular essay. He says, but to me, this, this looks very much like what a three-legged horse <laughs> would leave behind and walking at that if the walk had been correctly depicted. So what does he do? He goes back to the editions. He goes to the 1933 Doubleday Durand edition. Um, he finds the original rep representation of these hoof marks. He says they haven't changed in 1953. Goes back farther 
goes back to the manuscript of the Priory School, and he's apparently written uh, to the fellow who at that point had owned it, but uh, no information has yet to arrive from that particular source. And so he says, while I was waiting, you know, for any report from the manuscript, I kept going. I consulted the Strand magazine of February 1904 and the first English book edition by George Noons and the limited and the Baker Street Irregulars own heritage editions. And in all editions, um, you know, the marks of a horse walking were the same. And then he's got this little reprint of you know, sort of colon, space, space, colon, space, space, colon, space, space, and so on. So he says, I guess we have to agree Watson was right. And the editors agreed with him, not only in America, but in England. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> were, they, were they really right, he says? And so he reprints the layout of all the dots in three columns, the first English book and Murray editions, the first U.S. book edition, and then the limited uh, edition print uh, publication by the, by the Baker Street Irregulars and the Heritage Press editions, you know, which were, one was, a, one was sort of a derivation of the other. Yeah. And then we get to the conclusion where he says, you know, the one printed in the Strand magazine was so obviously ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That the publishers of the first English book edition dreamed up one of their own, which is what John Murray then followed. And, um, and then this was slightly changed, perhaps by McClure Phillips, uh, just to be different, but for no other discernible <laughs> reason. And uh, he reduces this down to two different portrayals. Yeah, and, and he says that any horseman worthy of his name knows the marks a horse makes when it walks, canters, or gallops. And if any reader thinks that we're being unfair by taking it for granted that Holmes, in arranging the breadcrumbs, and let's not forget, that's how all of this played out. They were, they were breadcrumbs on the table as they discussed this together. Uh, if, if, as Holmes ar arranged the breadcrumbs, arranged them in, in the ways that he did to indicate a respective walk, canter, and gallop of the horse, then it can only be said that the way he arranged the breadcrumbs uh, is, as depicted in any edition of the canon, cannot pass respectively or otherwise for a walk, a canter, uh, or, or a canter of any horse, whether it's a thoroughbred, a standard bred, a quarter horse, hack, Clydesdale, Percheron, Tennessee walking horse, Cobb, Palomino, <laughs> Shetland pony, or the lowliest, lowliest genus of Iquus Calabas that hauls the milk wagon around the benighted outpost of the empire. The Such gate is Toronto, Canada. Well, right, of course, uh, from from our, our friend um, Tupper Bigelow. He he says the gait of all horses is the same for a walk, a canter, and a gallop. But of course, differing slightly as human beings differ from the norm or average. Even a mule's gaits are the same as a horse's. Mm. So yeah. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we take a quick break from all this? walking, cantering, and galloping, and hear quickly from our sponsor. When you're looking for reference material regarding the Sherlock Holmes stories, the Baker Street Journal has been providing thoughtful articles since 1946. The topics range from the trifling to deep conundrums, but they all center around Sherlockian scholarship. And maybe you've been subscribing for years, or maybe you have yet to subscribe. But there's one resource that can make your research easier to do. The EBSJ. The EBSJ is an electronic copy of all the back issues of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 through 2011 in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages, spanning the old series to the new series, the Christmas annuals, all the way through 2011. It's entirely searchable, so you can find what you need in just seconds. Check out the EBSJ on BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. 
Now, I should mention, uh, we were going off uh, a little bit earlier in the episode about uh, Edgar Smith and Julian Wolfe and the Baker Street Journal. If you'd like to hear more about the history of the Baker Street Journal and its current iteration, uh, we have a link to episode 221 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, which was our interview with Stephen Rothman, the editor of the Baker Street Journal and the editor of A Remarkable Mixture, from which today's topic has been selected. Also, uh, Bert mentioned the Blind Beatles episode of Trifles. That is episode 246. We'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Well, the lovely thing is, now just think about the ground, the ground that we've covered here so far in the essay. You know, you would think we've dug into this pretty deeply, but no, no, no. Tupper Bigelow is about to really get off to the races. He says, you know, his last observation here is even for a, even a mule's gates are the same as a horse's. And he says, um, you know, from my experience, the look, he says the walk of a horse can be observed by anyone on the racing strip of a racetrack and each hind hoof will make a mark a matter of a few inches behind the mark the forehoof makes and actually what go what's going on here he says is the mark of the hind hoof superimposes itself now remember our pre- previous mentions in the canon about things like bicycle tracks and how one rear track might impose itself upon a pattern left by the by the front track oh that's this very same story by the yes, way yes <laughs> yes yes he says actually the mark of the hind hoof superimposes itself upon the mark of the fore hoof and if i were going to do this in dots he says the marks would look something like this so he has two dots, one side by side to the other, and then some distance below, exactly the same thing, two dots side by side from the other. And then a big gap, you know, if you were putting this on a piece of paper, about an inch, inch and a half, and then another pair of two dots and two dots, and then another inch and a half and two dots and two dots. Interesting here, he says, now look, although it's just a matter of an inch or two between these double dots, this distance, is really about three feet. So this dots, all this stuff with dots, he says, isn't according to scale or even close, but it's probably about as well as you can do because the page, you know, is only about five and a half inches wide. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it, we, we would have had to extend this illustration <laughs> across both uh, pages if we wish to uh, you know, do it to scale and appreciate exactly what the pattern was for more than a few steps. So, and, and he says Watson had it right. As nearly the gate of the gallop can be shown by dots, at least. He had it right in all editions except the Doubleday and Treasury editions. It, yeah. goes, li- it goes like this. And here uh, we have a series of single dots uh, one starting out on the left, all the way down the bottom. One in the middle, uh, 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 raised a little bit uh, after a space. And then a couple of spaces, and one at the very top. And then a couple more spaces, one back down in the middle. A couple more spaces, one up at the top. And in that case, he says the distance is about three and a half feet. <laughs> oh. and, and he goes on to observe that uh, it's, it's remarkable that Watson's errors in depicting the walk and the canter of the horse were wrong in view of the fact that both Watson and his literary agent had seen action in wars of the times in which they lived, and particularly when on the manuals of scouting mentioned in the bibliography were available to them on active service, or to some of their counterparts at least. These manuals deal, among many other things, with the gates of the horses, and some depict the hoof marks the horses make while traveling in uh, at all their gates in illustrations and photographs. The others describe them, and all agree. Yeah, it really is, really is wonderful. And uh, even before he gets to this point, Tupper Bigelow says, you know, horses are just like human beings. They get tired. Sometimes you start out on your right foot and sometimes you start out on your left foot. Sometimes you change. But in any case, he's pointing to the fact that both Watson and his literary agent had 
seen military action. Watson in Afghanistan, where, by the way, one of his brother officers was Adam Baden Powell, who founded the Boy Scouts and mm. who had uh, issued more guidelines and manuals about observing tracks. And Baden Powell was also in Afghanistan, celebrated for his defense of Mafeking in the Boer War. And he certainly should have famili been familiar to Conan Doyle and so on. But um, Tupper Bigelow ends all this. You know, you would just think we've covered this for every possible angle and looked at all sorts of resources by someone who's speaking to us with intimate knowledge of the track and horses. He says, by the way, I had some help here. I had some help by a member of the Ontario, from the member of the Ontario Racing Commission and a one-time cavalry officer who also is a scouting instructor, Brigadier C.S. McKee, CBE. He served with distinction in both world wars. And in spite of his advanced age today, he rides every day. And he is an authority on the hoof marks of horses at various gates. And he was in <laughs> of inestimable assistance to me in preparing this trifling monograph. Well, you know, that's interesting. I mean, we, excuse me, sir, what is your area of expertise? Oh, I, I'm, I'm an authority on the hoof marks of horses at various gates, of course. <laughs> can, you, can, can you imagine, you know, Tupper Bigelow dialing up the brigadier and saying, look, if you've got some time, I should like to pay you a call at luncheon next week and we can discuss a Sherlock Holmes case. And just to whet your interest, I'm going to be bringing with me a box of croutons. <laughs> oh, it's a Caesar <laughs> salad. Lovely. Oh, and you know, the here's, here's one of the most interesting things to me because, you know, you, you, you write a paper like this, you, you, you do all your research, you, you assemble it, and then you submit it for uh, publication. Well, there's an afterword here <laughs> where it, it seems that uh, Mr. Bigelow is updating us in real time. He says, and, and by now, and this is after the bibliography, and by now I've heard from Lee Block, who, who is the owner of the manuscript, who reports that the dots in the manuscript of the Priory School are precisely as they were reproduced in the Strand, which is to be expected. I've also heard from Julian Wolf, who has weighed in with the way the hoof marks are depicted in his Japanese edition of The Return of Sherlock Holmes from 1951. And here we have Gallop, Canter, and Walk. Gallop is uh, alternating single uh, dots, single periods. A walk is parallel dots, uh, periods, or colons, as they uh, uh, move along. And the canter is alternating two and one and two and one. So the colon period, colon period. And he says, the canter, so-called from the pace which pilgrims went on horseback to, to Thomas of Becket's tomb, sometimes called the Canterbury Gallop, was in triple time. Every third step was louder than the other two, owing to the first and third foot striking the ground as nearly as possible simultaneously. That's taken from The Music of Nature by A.T. Camden Pratt in the Strand Magazine from December 1893. Mm. Hmm. Well, there's so much to admire here as we do these reviews in this series, the master class, and look at these great works, these great essays from other days. You know, and you can look at Tupper Bigelow and admire his sport, his knowledge of sport, his spirit of investigation and inquiry, his scholarship, his knowledge of the turf. And all of that is not a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Shoes and new nails! Old shoes and new nails! Oh, there's something you should see! It is a remarkable car that trots, canters, and gallops! <laughs>